Good evening and welcome. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I'd first like to begin by mentioning Operation Survival who put together tonight's seminar. Operation Survival was headed by Mr. Michal Berman of blessed memory, as long as with, as well with Rabbi Jacob J. Hecht of blessed memory, who really were the leaders and looking out for our community in many of the different challenges we face then and certainly face today. Of course, we also thank uh, Rabbi Yankee Berman, who through his community work and his community outreach every single day, works for our community to try to protect us and help us with some of these challenges that we face in the modern world. This evening, we are joined with us, a gentleman who I met many years ago, whose wisdom uh, guides me and those that are unfortunately certain times in different positions that they have to help people. He's always available. And I think it's important to mention that Dr. Reedy not only is maybe the, one of the top experts in his field, but many times people do a profession just for a job. He really is passionate about it. He cares about it. These are some of the challenges he's faced within his own family and show, has shares those personal stories, which make it so important to all of us. This evening is not about us becoming experts, but rather becoming, giving for us to get some tools for us to become better parents, better educators, better community members to simply care for one another. We find ourselves in the period of time of the mourning of the students of Rabbi Akiva. And we all know that the plague that fell the students of Rabbi Akiva was that they, in Lahem, they did not conduct themselves with proper respect and want to love one and love for one another. Our Rebbe taught us many, many times how we have to behave to one another. And as a community, we have to look out for one another. And these tools, even if one is not affected by it personally or family, certainly as a community, we're all responsible for one another, have to care for one, one another. And therefore, it's important that everybody joins tonight and learns a little bit. I want to mention that there, are, there will be a Q&A at the end. So at any time, feel free to uh, private message the hosts so we can read those questions. They will be read out loud. but anonymously. And we also want to mention that next week, Tuesday night as well, will be a, the continuation of this series. We thank all our sponsors. Once again, we thank Rabbi Yankee Berman for putting in his effort. Without further ado, Dr. Reedy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rabbi. You can hear me okay, right? Great. Yes, perfect. I'm very humbled to be here and always glad to, to be welcomed by your community and just think of it as an honor to, to, to be with you. And like you said, it really is a shared journey with all of you. I, I'm going to do my very best tonight to tell you the, the lessons that I've gleaned, that I've learned over the past 26 years of working with young people and families. Some of it is not going to be necessarily intuitive. It'll be counter to what we might imagine, but I'll, I'll play it out as best as I can. And then like the rabbi said at the end, I'll, I'll do my best to answer any questions that are specific. We're talking about peer pressure this evening. We're talking about how to uh, embolden your children to resist peer pressure, how to respond to peer pressure. So I'm gonna talk about the soil and the foundation that is beneath the skills, and then I'm gonna get into some specific skills. The first thing that I wanted to start off with tonight is the idea of what's the most common mistake that parents make. And there, there are two or three that I think about, but the first one that comes to mind is the mistake that I made as a parent when I had my first of, of now my, my four children. I, I came into parenting and I was going to try to improve on, on the parenting of my parents. I was going to try to right any mistakes that they had made to, to improve upon those. And the second thing that came to me is that I was going to calmly tell my children, sometimes not so calmly, of course, tell my children how I felt when they acted a certain way, one way or the other. And I thought by doing this, this is a really important point. I thought by doing this, that my children would then learn right from wrong. I thought that when I told them that I was upset or sad or frustrated or worried, anxious, that they would then know that they were doing something wrong. I thought also conversely that when I told them that I was proud, happy, excited, 
that they would then know that they're doing right. And, and I think this is almost the, the idea that most parents have that are that have any kind of education, any kind of sensitivity, any, any kind of heart, is they just think, I'm going to tell my child how I feel when they behave a certain way, and that will be an indication to the child about the, the difference between right and wrong. My, 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 you might say negative feelings will be indications that they're doing wrong, and my positive feelings will be indications that, that they're doing right. But this is what I've learned in my history. And, and, and I, I must admit that a lot of my focus has shifted from working with the children directly to working with families and parents, children in the in, in community with their parents. Um, the first thing that I wanted to, to, to share with you is, is, is that lesson in working with the parents, what they've taught me in their own work. And it's this idea. Children who are parent pleasers become adults who are people pleasers, who then become parents who think it's the, the child's job to please the parents. And the pattern repeats itself over and over again. So when we start off believing that our parents' frustration or their happiness is our responsibility as children, we grow up believing that what other people think and feel about us is about us. So when I get asked, and I do get asked very often about peer pressure, about how it started, why children are so vulnerable to, to peer pressure, especially during their teen years, one of the things that I, I, I ask parents to courageously consider is, we're the ones who started it. We're the ones who programmed them to believe that somebody else's feelings are, uh, are about them. One of the things I've, I've learned in treating all age of people who are struggling with mental health issues or, or substance use issues, one of the things that, that we teach them is that, that what somebody else thinks about you, and I, I know everybody can relate to this because I know everybody listening to this has plenty of experiences where they're, they're living their values, they're, they're living what, what they consider to be true and dear to their heart, and when they do that, other people judge them. Other people look upon them with, 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 with anger, frustration, and confusion. So I, I've learned that, that when, we, when we teach our children this principle, it makes them susceptible to peer pressure. So when I see them in treatment, one of the things that we teach parents and children is that what other people think about you is none of your business. What other people feel is not necessarily about you. And, and the, the interesting thing about this idea is that parents themselves have to um, learn to not care what other people think, and, and especially their children. Because so much of, so many parenting struggles uh, come out of thinking that if our children are upset or angry or they tell us that they'll, they'll, they'll hate us or they'll never talk to us again, can immediately cause us to question ourselves. So again, the first principle is when we think about telling our children how we feel, children who are parent pleasers eventually become people pleasers. And those people also think it's their job to please children and think it's children's job, of course, to, to please parents. Going on from there, I want to talk about two myths. Uh, the first myth uh, regarding peer pressure is that I hear it all the time from all kinds of people. This idea that um, people say that we shouldn't need external validation. Well, that, that's nice to think about, but that's not the way human beings work. The infant and, and young child relies upon the parent for, for, for life. And how the parent feels about the child and reacts to the child begins to seep into the child and they start to think about themselves this way. So in other words, if my mother and father are upset with me, I, I, don't, I can't hear it or see it as a child that my mother and father are upset with me. I, I simply have the experience that something's wrong with me, that I'm bad. So the idea that we don't need external validation isn't true. The, the, the truth is that we need somebody that can see us in our in our beauty in our intelligence in our giftedness and value that but also value our humanity i guess it's early right 
uh, Rabbi, you're you're off mute, just so you know. Um, so so part of this process is not necessarily trying to say to the child, you know, don't worry about what other people think about you. Not saying that, but really trying to 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 regard them and all all of them as beautiful and and wonderful and a miracle. We we need external validation, but we need to find people who can value all of us, not just the pretty and the smart and the talented parts. People that experience praise and adoration only for the good parts of themselves, the successes, end up being terrified of being accountable and and saying they're sorry. In in essence, in in mental health circles, people that get valued and, and, and adored for their successes turn out to be what we call narcissists. They're very, very, um, they find it very difficult to, to, to own up to things, to, to say they're sorry, to make amends to other people. So that's the first myth, the myth that we shouldn't need external validation. Another myth that I hear parents teach to children, especially around peer pressure, and, and I, I heard this as a child, is the phrase misery loves company. Right? We, when, when, a, when a child is acting out and behaving, following the crowd, following a leader, not standing up for their values with, with their peers. We, we try to tell them misery love company, M- misery loves company. We say that in order to, to sort of shame them so that they feel bad. But the fact of the matter is everybody loves company. Everybody seeks connection. And this is why children look for connection wherever they can find it, even the, in, the, in the darkest of corners. So what the child is experiencing when they're falling prey to peer pressure are these two things. They're believing that their worth is dependent upon whether they're accepted by this group. They might be disappointing their parents at home or upsetting somebody in their family. And and the, the requirement for being accepted by this group is so simple that they can do it and, and find that soothing acceptance of, of connection. So the idea of saying misery loves company doesn't exactly express the entire truth. So those are, those are some things not to do. And I'll talk about what to replace it with. Instead of saying to my children, I'm really upset about something you do. I give them a consequence and a boundary. In fact, my, my daughter who is now 14, I think at the time of this story, she was probably 11 and they were driving to, uh, to get some, some dessert sometime during the, the summertime and her her two cousins were with her in the back seat of the car my mother and my wife were in the front seat of the car and they were pulling up to this this restaurant where they could make their order for, for desserts for some kind of treat and when they were doing this the, the the young kids in the back seat were playing and being loud and rambunctious like kids are being and at one point my mother had gotten fed up with this my, my wife had asked several times what they wanted for their treat, what they wanted for their order, and they weren't listening. And my mother turned around and scolded the, the three children in the back seat and said, you know, Michelle, your mother has been spent all day taking care of you kids and, and, and giving you kids what you wanted. And all, the least you could do is respect her and answer her question. And there was quiet in the back seat because my mother doesn't usually talk to people that way. And the grandchildren were surprised by it. And after a moment of silence, my, at the time, 11-year-old daughter said, can I say something? And my wife and, and my mother said, of course. And she said, Grandma, I think it's okay to have a boundary to give us a consequence, like maybe that if we don't order that we can't have dessert, but to shame us isn't really nice and isn't really fair. And then she asked my, my wife, her mother, for backing. And she said, Mom, what do you think about this? And my wife didn't want to step anywhere near confronting her her mother-in-law. But what my daughter was aware of is that boundaries and consequences are okay. But again, that, 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 that urge that we have to tell people how we feel, not, not just to tell them how we feel, but to tell them how we feel so they'll feel responsible for the feeling, that becomes the programming that makes our children susceptible to peer pressure. Because when they go out of the home, they're going to be going to summer camp. They're going to be spending time with, with peers their own age this summer. Their brains can't make the shift on a, very, on a very fundamental level. They can't make the shift from pleasing mom and dad 
to pleasing, you know, their, their, their peers. So they walk around believing that the way to feel good, the way to feel safe, the way to feel welcome, the way to feel belong is to do what other people want. So boundaries are not feelings. This comes Dr. from one Reed, of my... Dr. Dr. Reed, if I can interject a moment. So I'm dealing with a family in my community. They're having a little bit of challenges with their teenager. And the kid comes in after doing X, Y, or Z at school. And the mother loses it and says, if Johnny jumped off the bridge, would you jump off right. the bridge? And I tell the mother, actually, the chances are yes. Right. You're underestimating social peer pressure that if they were in the situation Johnny jumped off the bridge, they probably would join. Right. So my question to you is, A, do you think that is correct? And B, what would the correct response be in such a situation when a kid followed their peers to do something they shouldn't have been doing? That's a great question. And I love when you said the mother lost it because everybody can relate to losing it. You know, when we get dysregulated, we're, we're, we're going to lose it. We're going to, I've done that. And I could tell you stories about with my children. The ideal response is to be calm and curious. That's what the child needs. I remember one time my, my son, he's 29 years old now at the time he was a young teenager, maybe 13. And he had bullied some boy in our neighborhood who was, who was a few years younger and was, was developmentally um, disabled. And when I found out about this, just like the mother you shared, I lost it. And I, I, I said the things she said. I, I said to my son in, in rage and anger and embarrassment and shame, I said to him, um, I said, did it make you feel good to pick on somebody smaller than you? Does that make you feel like a, a big person? And he was shaking because he was scared. And I'm a big dad and I was showing lots of intense emotion. I said, did it make you feel like a big guy? And he said to me, yes, it did. It was actually, he gave the right answer, kind of like your answer. He probably would jump, jump off the bridge. And when he gave me that answer, I was more full of rage because the fact of the matter, I wasn't parenting him at that moment. I was dealing with my own embarrassment and shame in my community. My rage, my shame, I was giving to him. So the ideal response, and I'm not saying that this is easy, it's a practice, a discipline, is to take care of my own responsibility, my own feelings. I am responsible for my own feelings. We learn this. If, if you happen to have the unfortunate experience of having a family one that's addicted to substances or other, or other addiction patterns, and you find yourself in groups that help the family members, one of the first things that they will tell you is that your serenity, your peace, is your responsibility, nobody else's. So it's normal what you what you said. The ideal is to be curious, to ask questions, to wonder what's going on. See, that's the cure. The cure is helping the child understand themselves and to, to understand them. And we have to do that in the in the in 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 love and in patience. And if we if we act like this mother did or like I did in the example that I give, the child's just terrified, just ashamed themselves. And they're just trying to get away from that threat. There's a, there's a line that I love from one of my favorite books about parenting, and it says this. By the way, all of the, the slides that I'm reading off this evening are available. If you want to request them, you can request them and I'll send them. It's from a book called The Price of Privilege by Dr. Madeline Levine. And she says, when we coerce, that means using emotional intensity to try to manage behavior. When we coerce, intrude on, or take over for children unnecessarily, we may be spoiling them. But far more significant consequences are that interfering, interfering in their ability to become a self. Intrusion or support are two very different things. Support is about the needs of the child and intrusion is about the needs of the parent. So in your example, your question, and in my example with my son, what was driving the parent behavior was their own feelings. And our feelings are not our rational self. It's just that we're feeling so much intentionally and we want somebody else to take care of it. So we learn to be curious. If you can think of it, you know, take a time out. We're really good at talking about timeouts for children in this country. It's a much better approach than, than hitting them in some of the other ways that the people have parented in previous generations. 
but timeouts are for us. When my children act out now, I only have one child at home. The other three are, are living on their own or in college. When I act out, when my children act out now, one of the things I try to do is not respond in the moment. I try to walk away, and this is to your question, I try to take responsibility for regulating my nervous system, my threat response system, my, my anxiety, my anger, and then I come back. And when I take care of myself, this is really important, then I can come back to the child and be available for their needs. So we know two things about children. This is, this is getting into the meat of it. We know two things in, in, because of science. We know that a secure attachment is the number one thing that a parent can do for a child to promote resiliency and a sense of self, a sense of independence in the face of peer pressure, right? If the child feels safe and welcomed as they are, you can hear in that that they're not going to be susceptible or gullible to peer pressure. They're not going to be easy to, to be influenced if who they are is okay. So we know that healthy attachment, and healthy attachment is defined as the child feeling safe and welcomed. Having their internal world, the parent is interested in, in the feelings. Just the other day, my, my daughter came home with an F on a small assignment, a, a 10 out of 20 on one of her assignments. And the, the assignment was to, to read a book and talk about the, the, the arc of the, the story in a certain way. And I said to her, I said, I'm a writer, I'm an author. In fact, some of, I quoted this book that they had you read in my own class. I was being silly with her. And I said, you're gonna make me look bad, all, all tongue in cheek. And we talked about it. She said, I understood how to write about the story. I just didn't understand certain aspects of it. The points I got, were the points that, that I understood about storytelling. The points I didn't get were the specifics of the story. So you see, we're now engaged in a dialogue. I didn't come down hard on her. It was a small assignment. And I walked away and she told me she talked to her she told me she talked to her teacher the next day and things were going much better. And I didn't give a consequence and I didn't react with frustration and anger. So we know two things. We know that a secure attachment, research suggests that children who have a positive connection in life to another person, a secure person, are, are, are more capable of being resilient against the pressures of the world. So seeing your child, understanding your child. When I was a child, there was a TV show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure most people are familiar with it. Maybe not. I don't know. But Mr. Rogers was, was an expert at this. He never tried to get a child not to feel what they were feeling. He tried to give a child a safe place to feel it. So a secure attachment is the number one thing that, 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 that creates the resiliency. Now here's where it gets magical. This is the, 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 the heart of the matter this evening. The best predictor of your ability and my ability, the best predictor of our ability to provide a secure attachment to a child, which is to provide a safe environment and an environment where, where they're welcomed, is how much work we've done on our own childhood. It doesn't matter how good your childhood was or how bad it was. The best predictor of the ability for a parent to provide a secure attachment to a child is how much they've looked at their own childhood critically. And I'm not talking about negatively. I'm talking about looked at it, understood what happened, understood how they felt, made sense out of their own childhood. And the research on that is above most all research in psychology and in social sciences. And it's every culture that it gets studied in. It gets studied in countries, all levels of socioeconomic success, rich and poor, black and white, everybody. If a parent knows themselves, knows their history, understands their, their trauma, understands to some degree their parents' trauma, because our parents have trauma too. And, and I know a lot of you know that very, very, very clearly. Understand our grandparents' trauma to some small degree. The more we understand ourselves, the more we're capable of showing up to our children in ways that support their development. And then they won't go looking for acceptance and connection outside of the family because they found it inside of the family. So the take home is to, to look at yourself, to work on yourself, to work on your anxiety. That's a principal thing. 
If your anxiety is not your responsibility, you will hand it to the child as their responsibility. And what that sounds like is, I'm really, really, really scared that you're doing this thing. Please don't do this thing so I'm not scared. I'm really disappointed or angry that you're doing this thing. But again, remember, like I started, when we program our children to respond to our feelings as if it's their responsibility, we literally program their brains to be susceptible to peer pressure. Madeline Levine went on to say, and it is emotional closeness, maternal warmth in particular, that is as close as we get to a silver bullet against psychological problems. So this, this attachment, this warmth. I love this quote from somebody I just saw just last week. I don't know who she is. Her name is Amber Deslin. Don't know her. I saw it somewhere when I was scrolling through the internet. She said, secure attachment is the delicate tangle of feeling safe, interconnected, independent, and free. One of the things that I've tried to foster with my children, and I have made every error that a parent could make practically, is I try to make home a safe place to come. And I try to make home a safe place not to come. What I mean by that is, let's say I'm having a holiday party and one of my adult children wants to spend it with their partner, with their spouse. I want them to know that if they need to take care of themselves, it's okay. Of course, what I've discovered is when your children are, are safe to arrive, but also safe to say, hey, dad or mom, I don't want to come. When, they, when there's that kind of safety, they, they won't stay away. If they are allowed to take care of their needs in healthy ways with you, if they don't need to take care of you, they'll show up. But if they need to take care of you, they'll believe something's wrong with them. If they don't, they'll look for it somewhere else. They'll look for it in their peers. Let me read this quote. It says this. This is, I love this quote. It says, the research in the field of child development has demonstrated that a child's security of attachment, what I've been describing to parents, is very strongly, strongly related to a parent's understanding of their own early life experiences. I've had many folks from the Jewish community, Orthodox community, come to, a, we have an adult intensive where people look at their family. In fact, I've had many of them say that they got permission from their rabbi to do the work of looking at their childhood through, a, through an honest and, and critical lens. And they've told me, just like our, our non-Jewish clients, they've told me that it has been a liberating and eye-opening experience for them, just like this quote says. As a parent, making sense of your life is important, the authors go on to say, because it supports your ability to provide emotionally connecting and flexible relationships with your children. If you don't sort out your, the dents and bruises that you have, and every human being has dents and bruises, if you don't sort them out, you will be reactive and you won't be parenting to the child's needs, you'll be parenting to your needs. So attachment is the basis. Attachment is how to inoculate your, ch your children against peer pressure. Now I know everybody wants to come here for some skills. Every time I teach, no matter where I teach, I can talk about philosophy and psychology all day long, but people want to know what it sounds like for skills. I'm going to give you my five principles of healthy boundaries. Boundaries are the opposite, not the opposite, but boundaries are not, just like my daughter said to her, her grandmother in the car, respectfully, by the way. You know, grandma, it's okay to set a boundary with us and give us a consequence, but I don't think shaming is okay. That's the kind of the, the, where I'm going now. Let me tell you about five principles of setting healthy boundaries with your children and with your, with your friends, with your, with your spouse that can be helpful. The first key to healthy boundaries is boundaries are not for changing other people. It's not about if I set a boundary with my children, I can control them. I can shape them the way that I want. Boundaries are taking care of me. And as a father... I have certain responsibilities. I'm not going to let my young child play with a sharp knife. I'm not going to let my children go to parties where there's drugs and alcohol because I don't feel good about it because that's what, that's what my responsibility is. So is my child going to learn the lesson that I want? Maybe, maybe not. But over time, over time with exposure, they start to see the way that you're living your life and the joy that it brings you, and they want to live a life like yours. So principle number one, 
Boundaries aren't for changing other people. They're for taking care of yourself. And by the way, they do tend to change and impact other people. So we say things like, this is what I feel good about. This is what I need in this situation. Principle number two, don't make the boundary about being right. When my daughter asked me, my 27 year old daughter, who's graduating with her doctoral degree this year in clinical psychology, she did an interview of me. Somebody asked that, that instead of me interviewing people that somebody interviewed me and I, I chose her. She said to me, dad, of all the lessons that you teach, what's the one that you struggle with the most? And I said, my need to be right. And, and like most of us, I believe that if I was right and I had a good argument that nobody would fight with me. Well, guess what? Everybody fights with me still. And if I can give up being right and just say, this is what I'm okay with. This is what I'm not okay with. I might be crazy. I might be old fashioned. I might be an idiot, whatever word you want to use, but this is my boundary. This is the most powerful position that we can take. Think about it in your community. If someone came yelling at you about your beliefs, your practices, you know that there's no benefit in yelling back at them, but simply to stand quietly and demonstrate that this is what you believe. This is what you feel good about. This is your value. They don't have to agree. It's the most powerful position that we can take as a human being. In fact, it's the thesis of of my most recent book. I said in the recent book that we don't, in this way of thinking, what I'm describing, we don't get to be right anymore. We don't get to win anymore, but we do get to be a self. We do get to be a human, which is so much better. So key number two is don't make the boundary about being right, just making it about being yourself, being who you are. Number three. Similar to the the previous one that I just described, don't explain your decisions in an attempt to try to convince the child that that your boundary is the right boundary. Don't say things like, I'm doing this for your own good or because I love you, because they're not going to feel that way. The the, the magic, it's it's magic. And I know you, you can feel it. I know you've done this before, is when you say, look, I might be right, you might disagree, but this is this is the line in the sand that I draw. This is my belief. This, I think the Jewish community has a, a better handle on this than most folks. Because in your community, you're very connected. And you're, you, you do a great job of not being influenced by the world, no matter what they say. And you also let in truth that can be helpful, like having somebody like me talk about parenting and talk about children. So you shift from, I'm, I'm doing it for, for this wonderful reason, and proving to the child and getting to the, the child to agree with it, or... Or you just simply say, this is my boundary, like it or not. That's number three. Number four out of five. Number four out of five. Listen to them as much as, you're, as much as you can. Respond with genuine empathy and allow them to be angry. This is really important. This is the healthy attachment I was describing. Allow your child to be angry, hurt, or upset. I'm not talking about mistreating you. That's different. That's behavior. But so many parents want their child to agree and like it and not be upset. Allow the child to be angry. Allow the child to be hurt or upset with you and your decisions. And it sounds like this. I get it. You're angry and you're upset and it makes sense to me. I'm sorry it's so hard and I'm glad you're telling me how you feel. Or just simply listen and be silent. I can't tell you the difference. Again, it won't make a difference in in one specific conversation or two, but over time, over time, when your children are allowed to be themselves, see, that's the beauty. If the child, if you think about this, this is the genius of it. If if the child is allowed to be themselves and you're showing them, them that you're allowed to be yourself, then guess what happens if somebody they run into in their life starts treating them badly? Maybe a potential spouse or a friend, doesn't matter. And, and when, the, when your child says, look, I don't like the way you're treating me, and the other person will like do what most people do and say, well, this is, this is why I'm right, your child will say, because they were raised in a different family, they'll say, you don't understand. In our family, we didn't have to be right to set a boundary. We just got to have our boundary. So the way you're treating me, I'm not going to debate or argue or negotiate with you. I simply won't allow you to treat me that way. 
That's what you're modeling for them. Children become not who we tell them to be. Children become who we are to a certain extent. They, 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 they soak up the emotional messages, all, all the messages about what it means to be a person and to love another person. And they learn that. One of the things, I, I had a father one time that said, my, my, my adult daughter, she's coming home and I don't want her to, to, to make contact with her, her boyfriend. This was a 20-something-year-old daughter. And so he was saying to me, you know, what, what should I do to stop her? And I said, I don't know what boundaries you can have for a 22-year-old daughter. I, I just don't know. I guess you could threaten not to love her anymore or not to welcome her back into your home, but I wouldn't recommend that at all. That will lead to more mental health issues. But I said to him, here's the trick. It goes right to the peer pressure question. I said, if you can't honor your, her personhood, how is she supposed to stand up to this boyfriend that you don't like? If you can dominate her, if her job is to be what you say she should be in this relationship, how is she going to know to stand up? She won't even recognize being mistreated because it will, be, it will feel like home to her. That's a little bit dramatic to say, but that's the thinking. Skill number five or key number five, don't use your emotions to try to get people to change. When you do this, you're telling the child that their feelings are your responsibility. This will lead them to believing that what others think and feel about them is theirs to manage. Don't say I am angry, scared, or hurt as a substitute for setting a boundary. And I've already covered that. So going back to the five skills, five keys. It's not about being right. It's not about changing other people, setting boundaries and consequences. Don't try to explain it to them so you get them to agree. Um, let them feel what they feel. Let them not like it, be upset, and then don't use your emotions. And then here's what I say after all of this. Lastly, after all of this, we can say we're sorry when we fail. Every parent has limits. And every child will discover the end of those limits. We can say sorry when we fall short of the ideal. And with this, the child learns the most important lesson of all, what it means to be human. So inoculating your children against peer pressure is about honoring who they are, having boundaries that you feel good about, your values, your beliefs, you're allowed to do that, but not trying to emotionally coerce them, not reacting from anger or, or fear, taking that feeling, because I want to be clear about this. Every single parent that's listening to my voice, every single parent who loves a child will feel hurt and sadness and fear and worry when their child struggles or makes poor choices. You can't get out of that. But that's why you take that emotional energy and you talk to your spouse or you talk to your friend that you trust or you talk to your therapist or you talk to your support group of peers. And you talk about it over there so that when you come back to the child, you can be there for the child's needs instead of the child being there for your needs. One of the greatest therapists that ever lived said, this idea about being seen and being understood, he said, when a person realizes they've been deeply heard, his eyes moisten. I think in some real sense he is weeping for joy. It is as though he said, he was saying, thank you that somebody heard me. Somebody knows what it's like to be me. The number one predictor of mental health and wellness that we, that we know of is how well a child feels safe and welcome. I talk about in treatment. This is really important principle. When I teach therapists, I spend a lot of my time teaching therapists. I explain to them, it, it, safety, emotional safety. Think about this. Think about your child making choices, making mistakes, struggling. I explained to therapists, safety, emotional safety, is not the precursor to treatment. It's not the precursor to the intervention. It is the intervention. And we think that a lecture is the thing. When a person has a wall up, has an emotional wall up, when they're feeling unsafe, nothing can get through. Nothing. If, if, if therapy, think about my job as a therapist. 
If therapy was about lecturing, it'd be easy. Anybody could do it. If therapy was about having answers, all you'd have to do is study and read a whole bunch and just give the best wisdom that you can find. That's not what it is. That's not what parenting is. There's no correlation between a parent's intelligence and their child's mental health. There's no correlation between how many lectures you have memorized and your child's well-being. It is healthy boundaries, first and foremost, but then compassionate, curious listening and watching. And, and going back to the original idea, those two aren't at odds with each other. Having a healthy, clear boundary is not apart from listening and understanding and being curious about somebody. One of the things I wrote in, in, in my, one of my, my first book was, before we try to change behaviors. I knew I couldn't write a book about parenting and, and have it not have a chapter on behavioral management. I knew I couldn't do that. It wouldn't make sense to people. I didn't really want to, because I don't think that's what it's about, managing behavior. But if I didn't include it, every parent would question it. So I wrote a, I wrote a, a chapter about managing children's behavior. And what I said was, before, before we try to change a child's behavior, we would be wise to be curious about what that behavior is trying to tell us. If your children are falling prey to peer pressure, more important, more important than getting them not to do that is trying to understand why. Recently, I, I was doing therapy with a colleague. We were working together and the colleague a couple of times made some mistakes, some therapy mistakes. And, and during our break time, I pointed, I said, hey, this thing you said, this thing you did wasn't okay. And my colleague said, oh, you got it. You're right. I'm sorry. You caught me. Did that a couple of times. And I, I finally said to him, I said, I, I'm not trying to catch you. You're not in trouble. I, I'm wondering what's going on. You seem angry at the client, sometimes angry at me. But because he grew up in homes where behavioral management and behavioral choices were more important, than discovering who he was, he couldn't hear my feedback during our breaks as anything but criticism and an attack. He was feeling threatened, putting his hands up. So be curious, be a safe person. You want to be that person that your child can come to and tell you about something when they're in a really tough spot in life. I, I say to parents, be the person that they can come to. So it's about being emotionally safe. And what does that require of you? Back to the beginning, back to this whole presentation is you've got to do your work. Parent education, this is important. Parent education, parent skills aren't for changing children. Parent education and parenting skills are for changing parents. We would be wise not to try to, don't try to fix your child's issue with with, with peer pressure, try to understand it. And when you understand it and you reflect that back, it will be fixed. Here's the direct quote, parenting skills and principles don't change children, they change parents. And that change in a parent can have a wonderful impact on the child. Healthy parenting is the, is the end, not the means to an end. So, in conclusion, clear boundaries. Don't use emotions and coercion to try to control your children. Don't focus on behaviors, good or bad, but focus on what's going on inside of the child. And when you do that kind of thing, your child goes out into the world with a secure sense of themselves. And then when someone says, hey, you're not cool if you don't do this or just do it to fit in, they don't need that because they already have their secure base at home. They already have their secure sense of self that was built at home. They already know who they are. And that's really what peer pressure is about. Peer pressure, you know, during adolescence, peers are trying to discover who they are. And if the way that they, growing up prior to that, the way they, they were supposed to have learned how they were was by other people telling them who they were, they won't know. They'll be just as vulnerable to peer pressure as anything. But if parents, in your, it's never too late. That's another thing I get asked. You know, we're coming about on summer. It's never too late to improve it and do it better. It's never uh, too late to change the course of parenting. 
I look for opportunities to say I'm sorry to my children because that's the best way to teach them how to say sorry. Not to tell them to say that they're sorry, again, but I show them I make mistakes all the time. And when I say I'm sorry, they let their wall down a little bit. And then guess what happens when their wall down? Wall comes down a little bit. You get to give them the lecture that you wanted to give them in the first place because now they're open to it. You get to teach them. But more important than what you say through your lectures and teaching, it's going to be about how you are with them. What we know about psychology is, and that's why, I suppose that's why you have me back. This is my fourth time speaking to your community is because I don't say what everybody else is saying. I, I don't have lists of steps that if you, if you take, I can guarantee that your children will turn out exactly how you want them. I tell you a, a way of being, what your work is, how, how we create the problems in our children. But that takes work. That's deep work. That, that's not skill-based. That's, that's part of your humanity. And then they go out in the world and nobody can push them around. When they grow up in a family where being seen and being a self was enough. I had a father one time ask me this question. He said, you know, he came up to me after a parenting lecture and he said, Brad, I want to understand. Um, I was wondering if you could give me an article that talks about the negative effects of marijuana. And I said, I, I could gather some of those up for you and, and give them to you if you would like. Um, and then I asked, why, why do you need that? He said, well, I have a, a young adult son who's living in my basement, smoking marijuana and playing video games all day. So I said to the dad, I said, why don't you just tell him that you're not okay with it? And the dad looked at me and he said the thing that told me everything about his childhood. He said, is that enough? And I said, it's all you got. But he didn't grow up in a home where being a self was enough. Being himself was enough. Just like I didn't grow up in a home where being who I was, was I had to learn this stuff the hard way. I had to find, in my case, a therapist who I've been going to for the past 23 years that I still go to every Friday morning at 11 a.m. And I go back there again and again to find myself. And then when I come home, I'm a better husband. I'm a better father, not because we talked about parenting or parenting skills or parenting techniques and tools, but because I'm okay. I've healed myself. I've dealt with my frustration from the week, my anger for the week. I've dealt with the fact that I only have a limited capacity. And when I take care of myself in that 11 to 12 o'clock hour, 11 to 12 o'clock hour, every Friday at, at, at 11 a.m., then I come home and I'm more able, more present for being there for my children. And, and this is important. On my bad days, I have no patience. If I'm hungry or tired or I've worked too much, I don't have any patience for those people in the other room. I don't have any patience for my, my wife and my children. But if I can take care of myself in, in the ways that I need to take, take care of myself, and I've, I've had to learn what those are, and it includes taking a time out. It includes taking care of my emotions so nobody else has to do it for me. Then when I go out there, I have love to give. I have patience to give. I have time to give to them. And again, our children learn who they are by the way that we feel about them. And if we feel badly about them, I promise you, they will look for peers and they will look for peer acceptance and they will do just about anything to find acceptance. And I'm not trying to lay a real heavy weight on your shoulders. I'm not trying to be really negative, but that's the psychology. That's the truth. That's the truth. We've all heard the phrase, cut off your nose to spite your face, right? We think that children following somebody into a stupid behavior or stupid act is somehow, um, we can't even imagine why they would do it. Well, they're doing it because it feels good to not be alone. It feels good to be accepted. Even if that acceptance was based on participation in this breaking of a rule or breaking of a value or doing something unkind, it doesn't matter because all they want is what every human being needs, which is to feel okay about themselves. When I teach this to therapists, this is called attachment theory, what I'm talking about tonight. That's the basis of my work. When I teach this about ther to therapists, 
who are working with adolescent boys and girls and their families, they'll often say to me, but Brad, you know, our clients, the people that come to us have very serious problems. They have, and the parents are paying us a lot of money to, to help and, and encourage their children to change and to improve. And my response is, I know that. This is how you do it. Madeline Levine, I'll end with this story, and then I'll take questions. Madeline Levine, she's a therapist in the Bay Area in Marin County, California. And at the end of, of her week, one week, she looked at her appointment book, and it was full of children from families that there was no divorce. The families had enough money to take care of all of their basic needs. On the surface, none of these families seemed to be in trouble. And yet she was dealing with children who were hurting themselves, children that were using substances, alcohol and drugs, self-harming, some of them even suicidal, some of them so anxious they couldn't go to school, a variety of issues. And she said to herself, what's going on here? Why do these children from quote unquote good families, uh, why are they struggling in these ways? And so she went about, she studied New, some areas in New York City and Chicago and some other areas in the country. And she concluded this idea that I'm gonna share with you, which is the, the, the thesis of tonight's lecture. She said, the problem was, is that parents were trying to raise their kids to be good kids, good students, good athletes, good citizens. And she said, the pressure of being good was so great that they were overwhelmed with it. And the, 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 the behaviors that they were displaying were, were an attack on themselves, by themselves, because they were failing. She said, the real goal is to raise a child not to be a good person, but to be a whole person, to be who they are. And when we encourage children to be who they are, all the love, all the creativity, all the generosity, all the wisdom comes with it. But teaching a child to be a good something or other, that's an impossible task to live up to. And guess what happens when they make mistakes? They can't apologize. They can't confess it. They can't admit to it. They'll deny and defend it all day long. So the great inoculation, the great take home from all of this is that our job, my job, is to raise children to be themselves, to be who they are. And I have seen my older children and I'm seeing my younger children go through it too. When I can do that, or, or to the extent that I can do that, I get to contribute to this wonderful, generous, love-filled, purpose-filled life. And as you know, there's no greater joy than watching your child experience that. All right, I'm happy to take any questions. I have dropped the slides in the, um, in the chat. But I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Dr. Reedy, so you mentioned the concept of children doing something that is incorrect. Sometimes we have to understand, is that bad for the child or is it bad for our image of ourselves or our, our image in the community and standing rather than looking at it from the perspective of the child? You also mentioned that the most important thing is the child is proud of who they are. So when they're in certain situations, they're gonna make that this is below, if I can use the terminology, it's below my dignity to do X, Y, and Z. Sure. Is this principle true of children of all ages if I'm dealing with a nine-year-old and a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old? I think I'm speaking more, Rabbi, to the, to the teenagers. It, it, you know, I'll tell you, Rabbi, a story. That's how I do this. I came home from a business trip and, and before COVID, I traveled quite a bit for work. And um, when I arrived home from my trip, I'd been gone three or four days. Uh, we had a, we had a, 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 a woman that was a, a nanny for us for years and years and years. And my wife was out doing something. She wasn't home when I got home. I got home in the middle of the day. And at the time, my youngest, who was probably three or four, somewhere in that range, um, she saw me come through the door. And she was with her nanny, whom we, we still love. We still have uh, a relationship with. She was standing next to her nanny. She saw me and she ran into the laundry room and hid from me. And I heard the, I heard the, the nanny say um, to my daughter, she said, 
don't run, don't run away from your dad. Tell him how much you love him and missed him. And I said to the nanny, I said, it's okay. I got this. I understand. That's exactly what a child would do when their heart is broken because their dad always, I mean, that's one thing that they would do, right? They could also rush. And so I, I came into the laundry room quietly and I, I got low and I just said, are you sad that dad is away so much? And she said, yeah. And she was crying. And I said, I'm so sorry. It's so hard for me not to be here. And she came over and gave me a hug. My son, my 29 year old, when he was five, he taught me back this lesson, Rabbi, the answer to your question. We were watching the Disney cartoon, Captain Hook, or excuse me, Peter Pan. We were watching Peter Pan, the Disney cartoon. And my son pressed pause on the DVD machine, five years old. And he turned to me and he said, Dad, Captain Hook isn't bad, is he? He's just sad. And I said, that's right. He's just sad. And my son said, I thought so. And he pressed play. So part of it is, yes, it can work with little kids. It can work with, you're allowed to be mad at dad. You're allowed to be sad. I didn't, my ego, my role as the patriarch in the family wasn't threatened by the fact that this three or four-year-old ran into the other room when I came home. And I didn't need to lecture her. And I definitely didn't need the nanny telling her that she should greet me the way that the nanny thinks that she could. I wanted to understand her. And so it, it, people ask that question. I think it's the, the examples I, I have given you tonight have mostly been about teenagers and, and young adults, but it can start very young. If your child is allowed to feel what they feel. You know, my mother used to say to me when I was a kid, my mother would say to me, you're being melodramatic. You're being dramatic, she would tell me. And I learned from a very young age that my feelings were were bad, were overwhelming. And so I, I tried not to feel. And that led to some problems later on. And she told me that when I was five and six and seven years old. So yes, the principles apply everywhere. In fact, attachment research, the, the attachment research that I've shared with you is mostly related to preteen kids. By the time they're teenagers, it gets much more complex, but it applies to every, and I'll, I'll say one last thing. If your child is 25 years old, it, it applies. It applies. I have children that are full grown adults living full, wonderful lives. And I try to welcome them and they're very different from me and they're very different from each other. And I try to welcome them back. And I always say to them, if this is not a safe place for you to be, you don't have to come. I promise you. But of course, when you say that, when you, when you, when you live that, that's all they want to do is hang out with you because then they can be themselves. They can express different opinions, different ideas, different feelings. They can tell me when I hurt them and I don't defend it and tell them I'm, I'm just trying to do, do this from love. I just say, I'm so glad that you told me. One of the, the, the slides that I didn't share that, that I didn't read is a list of, of, of safe and unsafe responses. So in that, that, that document that I gave to you and that the rabbi has given out to everybody else, there's a list of what it sounds like to be safe. But yes, it can, it can apply to every age, every age. Even a child who's 60 years old, it can apply to. Uh, there's a question over here that my child of 11 or 12 years old was being called uh, by some peers that they're not cool enough. Now I caught him trying to uh, practice smoking a cigarette, trying right. to look cool. How would a parent go about approaching that child and dealing with you know, saying something to that child? Two things. You're allowed to have a boundary and a consequence. I don't, wanna, I don't want anyone to ever hear me saying you're not allowed to. That's part of healthy parenting. But underneath and around that, oh, I know what I wanted to tell you tonight. I'm so glad you asked that question. I'm going to give you the best lecture. Every parent wants to lecture their kids about peer pressure. Um, peer pressure is the top three complaints that parents have when they send children to my therapeutic program. The top three. And they want to lecture their kids about peer pressure, things like don't worry about what they think about you or you know, self-esteem is, is comes from inside of you or just worry about what God thinks about you. all kinds of lectures. And here's my favorite, my favorite lecture on peer pressure. I think everybody listening to me, if they had courage, they could give it. Say to your child, something like this, say to your 11, you know, something like this. I sometimes worry about what people think about me too. Sometimes it's hard for me to stand up for my beliefs in my family, in my community, in public. Um, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to worry about what people think about you and to try to impress or fit in 
or have people think you're cool. End of lecture. And then give the consequence. Do you see the shift? Then you're not right. You're not perfect. You don't have all the answers. If, if there's somebody on this broadcast that never worries about what anybody thinks about them ever in their community or outside of the community, I'd like to meet you because I've never met a person that doesn't have any, any drive, any instinct to sometimes worry. When, when my son came home having bullied the kid, not only was bullying a kid against my core value, I think against every parent's core values, but I was also embarrassed. That was, that was the, the energy that drove my intense rage and anger was my embarrassment. And so you're saying that we also suffer from peer pressure. So tell your, tell your child about it. have the consequence Do you know, he may not be allowed to hang, but tell him that you know what it's like so that he feels safe. Then he can tell you about it. Then he can talk about it and he doesn't feel like he's some Martian. But if you act like you've got it all figured out and you're just going to talk down to him, you will not connect to him. Thank you. Uh, one more thing. I, um, um, Gabor Mate wrote a book called uh, Hold On to Your Children, Why the Relationships of Parents Should Be More Important or Greater Influence Than Relationship of Pairs. And certainly in the time of social media, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we know that uh, the bullying on social media, which were other th subjects you've addressed in the past to, uh, yeah. through Operation Survival. My question is, how much is that intergenerational that our, that our, if our children see us, that our relationships to our uh, parents are more important than our peers and things of the sort? Does that play a role in, in children seeing it within us and the respect we, we pay to our elders and how important that is that, you know, that relationship to us, how does that play a role with uh, our children watching it and observing because their children do observe everything that we do. You know, um, my mother said something to me some a few years ago that was a real gift. She said, you'll never love your parents as much as you love your children. And I remember being relieved and grateful for that. She's right. In my experience, you know, you love the people that you sac make sacrifices for. And, and my mother was letting me off the hook saying, look, you're never going to love me as much as I'm going to love you. And your children are never going to love you as much as, as you love them. The second principle is we want our children to differentiate from us when they be, as they be, when it's appropriate. See attachment. When you, I wrote this, the child's inner voice, the child, the voice inside of the child's head, where it comes from is how you feel about them. How a parent feels about the child, I wrote, becomes the child's inner voice. And so if I know that I'm okay, and unfortunately, Rabbi, I didn't know that I was okay growing up. I, I, my, my parents had a, a lot of issues, a lot of flaws. My father wasn't around. My mother was doing the best she could to raise three boys. I'm sure she was, I can imagine how overwhelming it was. So I didn't know, I didn't come out of childhood knowing I was okay. So I spent... 25 years trying to impress everybody with how smart and clever and right I was. And eventually I had to go through my own work and my own therapy and realize I'm okay. And now I'm much more loving. I'm much more patient. If a friend or a especially a client, if a child gets mad at me, I can own my part of it. I can take that, that, that part of it. So um, what Gabor Mate is saying it's natural for children to differentiate from children, but they carry, they carry an image of, of, they carry the image of themselves and how you saw them around with them. And if they know that they're okay, they know they're beautiful, they know they're worthwhile, they carry that around with them in the world and it never goes away. If they don't have that in there, see my dad left. So what did I learn? I learned that I wasn't worth staying around for and I wasn't lovable. So then I spent years going to school, trying to impress people, getting letters behind my name, trying to get lots of money and cars to show everybody how great I was. And if you had seen me in that time, you would have thought this guy's an arrogant narcissist and you'd have been right. Until a, a certain point in my life when I realized I'm not happy. This isn't working. All the cars, all the money, all the letters behind my name, all the notoriety isn't doing anything for me. And through therapy and healing, I realized my worth is more 
It's more, it's more internal than that. So yes, we, 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 we separate. It would be unhealthy for a child not to differentiate from parents. It would be unhealthy. There's an amount of rebellion that's appropriate developmentally. But if you're a safe person to rebel against, it doesn't threaten you. You don't, you know, when, when my, I, my children still come back for the holidays, which I'm grateful for. I love spending time with my children. My older children are my best friends, period. No doubt about it. But part of the reason why they, I get to cling to them, Rabbi, and they get to cling to me is because I let them go. That when they, if they were to say to me, I'm going to spend the holidays over here I'm with so-and-so or with, I would say, we'll miss you. Take care of yourself. And when you're that kind of a parent, you get to, they come back. They run back into your arms and they say, you're the easiest. Everywhere else we go, we have to take care of everybody else. But here, you seem to be taking care of yourself. So it's, it's safe and loving to be with you. And so, yes, we cling to them. Yes, we're connected to them. Yes, they carry us around. But they have to be able to go. They have to be able to come and go. They have, we have to be okay. This is a really big thing in a lot of communities. I have to be okay with your leaving. And if I'm not, if you need to stay to take care of me, I'm not a safe person. And you might stay around out of obligation and guilt, but that's no fun for anybody. Then you're just coming to, to check off a box that you're a good son or a good daughter. And I can feel that, right? I can feel that. I can sense that. But if you come back because you want to, which is what my children are doing, you win. And they win. We uh, thank Operation Survival this e for setting up this evening. We uh, thank uh, Rabbi Yankee Berman for his hard work and his effort on behalf of this series as well as all the other series and all the work that Operation Survival does in our, in our community. Remind you that next week, the same exact time on Zoom, please join us for the next lecture. And of course, we are so grateful to you, Dr. Reedy. You have been a pillar of support for many leaders within the community. You've always been available. Your guidance and your wisdom um, is truly appreciated. And may, as they say, bless, we bless you as you go from strength to strength to, to continue to bring peace into homes and to families and helping us creating a stronger community as well. So thank you very much. Uh, thank everybody for joining us tonight.